It's morning in Black Lake, and the Rumbottom Estate has proven just as unwilling to negotiate as its neighbors, this time regarding a particular painting. The avid collector and her red-headed assistant must again resort to common burglary. A job for Black, Bard, Bones, and Boar. Oh, we And not without help, Tom's Rumbottom's former groom, this scrawny nervous man here, has even offered to hold the door open for the Black Lake burglars. The Rumbottom Estate. They're no more prepared now than they were yesterday at the Hodge Estate, and put their best burgling tool to use. Bones. Holy cow. All right. <laughs> Looks like about four rum bottom house guards. Can't quite tell if they saw bones yet. I don't think so. No. Wanda fire is gone. So I don't know. She might be able to target a Wanda sleep. Might be a long shot. <laughs> Alright, try it. Not sure what the range is either. Alright, here they come. All right, let's take them down. Holy cow. I need you to watch my back. You won't mind that too much, will you? <laughs> All right, negative energy. What are they doing? All right, crew. You! Alright, Rotter Frost. It appears to be a barracks of some sort for the privately hired Rumbottom Guard. Not unlike Hodge's private guard, but these men actually lived here at the estate. Louis impressed. Not every noble can afford such a luxury, nor can every guard hope to live so well. The keg stinks of some local stout, but it's certainly not some common cheap watered down ale. The Rumbottoms must be wealthy indeed. But Lily counts six cots, and only four guards were dispatched. Where are the other two? Probably relieving themselves of Rumbottom's good fortune out in the stables, if she were to guess. They must have been playing cars, too. Lily got four of a kind. This is also likely the first time that they were called upon to perform the service for which they are hired. And they failed. Miserably. Trained at the academy under Sir Dyer, no doubt. Lily's at least glad to see that Rumbottom has taste. In the main hall, 
antique stone gargoyle statues, and no recessed bathing pool as at the Hodge Inn. Just a fountain. Simple, elegant, timeless. Bones can tell. Something's not right. He can even hear the Black Lake Bard. Somebody must have returned from the stables already, and he's likely raised the stakes. Holy cow. Alright, just got ambushed by a guard. Alright, crew. Let's take them down. Not sure where he came from. Luckily, I think he was attacking the boar. All right, negative energy. Yeah, she didn't resort to melee combat. That's kind of <laughs> problematic. I think they'd at least implement that. All right. Little Red claims that she saw one of the gargoyle statues move out of the corner of her eye. Lily resets bones ahead regardless. So how wealthy are the rum bottoms? Unlike a masseuse, midwife, or even a cook, the duty of a guard is inherently dangerous. Though the halfling at the Hodge estate may beg to differ if he were still alive to do so. That risk to life and limb comes at a price. Private guards for hire are usually lacking their own equipment and so accept less pay, but they also tend to be not as well trained as we've seen both here and at the Hodge estate. Regardless, they need to be properly outfitted with arms and armor. A contingent of guards would have to be led as well. This captain of sorts would obviously be more expensive than those he commanded, and would likely expect superior equipment. Done and, done. and then, of course, all these guards, captain and lackeys alike, have to be housed. Holy cow, there we go. Guard dog. Can't tell, it's probably not the only one. It's the only one Bones and O's about right now. All right. Rod of Frost. <laughs> There's another one. All right, crew. Let's take them down. What is Bones doing? Almost looked like he was about to attack Sharwin. All right, Rod of Frost.
Not just guards, but guard dogs. The Rumbottoms must be wealthy indeed. Not that they'd have to be paid a wage, obviously, but the dog has to be paid for, and so does the handler that teaches them all those varied commands. Not just guard, but things like come to follow its master. Defend if he finds himself ambushed in his own kitchen. Down if it attacks the messenger. Fetch for his slippers. Heal to impress the neighbors. Stay when he's had enough. And the countless other simple tricks that dogs simply seem to be born with the knowledge of how to do, like sitting up, rolling over, barking on command, and so on. And just like the captain and his lackeys, they need to be housed. Lee tries to come up with a rough estimate of Tom's Rumbottom's expenses. Five guards. Short swords and uniforms for all. Eleven gold a head. Two silver per day with time off once every ten day and for annual holidays. That's fifty-five to start, three hundred and twenty-four per year. Then there's the captain. Give him a shield as well as the short sword and a fancy uniform. 15 gold. 6 silver per day, with the same schedule. That's 15 to start, 195 per year. And then, two dogs at 25 a head, and likely overcharged an additional 125 for training. That's 300 to start. Tom's Rumbottom was willing to pay close to 1,000 gold for the first year. Needless to say, he isn't getting his money's worth. He should have just splurged for a single stone golem. Oh boy. Alright. Wow. Alright, there's quite a few of them in there. Probably try uh, sleep again. I don't think it worked at all. Try it again. I think we're going to be in trouble. <laughs> I think she's just going to keep casting sleep until uh, we're just about all down. else for this last one? You cannot win. Fury. Oh boy. Alright, we're calling bones. Negative energy. Alright, one guy's still asleep. Rod of Frost. Bone zooing. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Negative energy. Holy 
Holy cow, still one here. Negative energy. You cannot win. I hope that doesn't. Let's miss it. I was gonna say, I hope that doesn't provoke a attack of opportunity using a wand. I can't even remember. Yeah, I remember when third edition was released with attacks of opportunity, and I also remember how confusing it was at first to know what did and didn't provoke one. An attack of opportunity is simply an extra single melee attack given to your enemy in the current combat round. Of course, your character has to be within melee range and actually doing something to provoke the attack. I guess the theory is that there are just some actions that if performed by your character, they'd be unable to actively defend themselves, thus provoking an attack of opportunity, such as firing a ranged weapon like a bow or crossbow. Casting a spell? Yes. Concentrating to maintain one? No. Activating a magic item? Maybe. <laughs> Using a spell-like ability? Yes. Using a supernatural or extraordinary ability? No. Running? Yes. Walking? Maybe. <laughs> Sheathing a weapon? Yes. Drawing a weapon? No. Now this goes on and on, which is why I never remember any of it. Anyway, only spell completion items like scrolls provoke attacks of opportunity. Not spell trigger, command word, or use activated items like wands, staves, and the like. Except potions. They do provoke an attack of opportunity. Lily decides that they should rest for a bit before venturing into the west wing, but not here in the guard barracks. It stinks of not only sweat and stout, but must have served as a makeshift kennel as well. Actually, well... <laughs> They're going to rest. I just want to point out how much faster time passes in the Aurora engine as compared to the Infinity engine. In Baldur's Gate, either the first or the second, you'd have to play for about two hours before a full day passes in-game. That's about a 1 to 12 ratio. Here, however, in Neverwinter Nights, you'd have to play only 48 minutes before a full day passes. That's a 1 to 30 ratio. It's more than twice as fast. Why they decided to speed things up so much, I have no idea, but I have to admit, <laughs> it doesn't quite feel as realistic as Lily and company will likely take more than a whole day to rob the Rumbottom estate, with or without resting. 